Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we have a special guest today that we're very honored to have with us. He is a 36-year-old successful businessman who left the role behind uh, to be of service to his country by being a senior advisor to the President of the United States, ladies and gentlemen, Jared Kushner. How are you doing? Great. Thank you for having me. And Thank you for being here. Thank you. It's an honor it's to good. be here. I know a lot of people in the audience here, and it's really an honor to be able to talk about this topic with so many people who I respect uh, so much, who have given so much to this issue. So. Great. You've been in the news in the last uh, few days, to say the least. Yeah. But you've been in the news um, about an issue that uh, I personally want to thank you for, uh, because you and your team uh, were uh, taking steps to try and get the uh, United Nations Security Council uh, to not go along with what ended up being an abstention by the US uh, against a 50-year-old tradition um, and to be honest with you, uh, some people might criticize, uh, as far as I know, there's nothing illegal there, uh, but uh, I think that this crowd and myself want to thank you for making that effort. So thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. The president has referred uh, to the Middle East peace as the ultimate deal. Everyone here knows that. Experts give you high marks for trying, but none of them believe it's possible. Why do you think it's possible? Or do you think it's possible? Let's start right with it then. So. Okay, yes. Um, so uh, the president has a very long career of accomplishing things that a lot of people uh, say were impossible. I think the most recent example of that uh, is the election, where a lot of people who were the experts on the election thought that was impossible, and the president took a very unconventional approach towards running and was ultimately successful uh, with that. Uh, when we started the process of looking at how to create the peace uh, between the Israelis and the Palestinians, the first thing a lot of people told us was that it wasn't the right time. The conditions weren't right. Uh, after years of distrust, uh, we were really wasting our time to do it. The approach we've taken, uh, even Barack Ravid uh, wrote recently that the president's injected peace back into the discussions, and that's something we're very proud of because we do think it is achievable, and we think that there is um, a lot of reasons why this is a time, why it should happen. Uh, when you look at the region, you have uh, several issues that are of grave concern to people. You have Iran and, and their, their nuclear ambitions and their, um, and their expansive uh, regional uh, mischief. Uh, you have uh, ISIS, which this administration's done a really great job of beating back and, and uh, almost defeating at this point. Uh, you have uh, the ideology, you know, the extremism, which I think you're now seeing a lot of uh, leaders in the, the, the Muslim world try to uh, restore uh, store, uh, the religion to what, it, to what it always has been and to uh, try to eliminate the ability for people to, uh, to, to pervert it in the way they have. And then you have the Israeli-Palestinian issue. And I think that if we're going to try and create more stability in the region as a whole, you have to solve this, 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 this issue. And so the president sees it as something that, uh, that, that, that has to be solved, that he very much wants to be solved. And it's something that he's personally put a lot of time into trying to see happen. I, I understand that. But to achieve that, the team has in it an entrepreneur, you, a real estate lawyer, a bankruptcy lawyer. I don't know how you've lasted eight months in this lineup, but that's a, for another day. And it's impressive that it's still going. There's not a Middle East macher in this group. So, I mean, how do you operate? with people who basically 
you know, uh, with all due respect, a bunch of orthodox Jews who uh, have no idea about anything. <laughs> So, what are so, you guys doing? So, so, so I'll, I'll definitely no, se say, seriously, I don't understand this. <laughs> so I'll, I'll definitely say it's not a conventional team, but... Uh, oh, you can say that again. Yeah, 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 so, yeah. That's what I said. That's yeah. what I said. Well, say it again. Okay. <laughs> it's a perfectly qualified team um, in the way Haim sees it. So, uh, how is that? No, no, I was joking. Oh, uh, okay. So, uh, so, so we have... Um, uh, so when, when, when we were thinking about how to put a team together, the, the president... Uh, and I focused on uh, who had the right qualifications, uh, who uh, we both trusted. And, uh, you know, we have David Friedman, who's one of the most brilliant uh, bankruptcy lawyers, um, who uh, is a close friend it's of It's a mom. bankrupt situation, so, yeah. <laughs> so it's appropriate to have a bankruptcy lawyer. You, you could argue that you're wondering why they've never had a bankruptcy lawyer working on this before. <laughs> so, and it's a real estate issue, too, so you're the real estate aspect, so. Well, well, actually, so there's no better uh, real estate lawyer than Jason Greenblatt, who's been working on this. And uh, there are a lot of real estate-related issues to it, but it's also uh, a function of being able to listen to all the different sides and, and, and understand them and the personalities work. Uh, we also have Dina Powell, uh, who works with us, who uh, has been very instrumental. Uh, her family's uh, Egyptian. She speaks Arabic. But her, her, uh, she's been very instrumental in helping us develop uh, a regional uh, aspirational economic plan for what could happen post peace, because we don't view a peace agreement just as signing a piece of paper and then hoping everything works out. We're focused on what happens after and how do you create uh, an environment where 10 years uh, down the road, uh, the people who are beneficiaries of the peace have jobs and opportunity that they didn't have before. So that's really how the teams work. I'd say that the best thing um, about the team is there is a lot of trust within the team. And uh, the fact that we're so close, there's been no leaks on the process to date, has enabled a lot of the uh, sides that we work with to, to be able to work with us maybe in a more open format than they would have. So what we found originally was there was a lot of uh, hesitancy from uh, the people on both sides to share ideas, to really um, explore the ideas with us in a way that could be constructive to come to conclusions. Uh, but what we found is as they saw that nothing would leak out and we could have honest and open dialogues and that we were really listening to what they, uh, what they had to say and what their issues were and how they thought things could be resolved, we saw that the, uh, the conversations really opened up a lot. Well, I'm happy you mentioned trust because mm -hmm. there's no trust between the sides at all. Uh, you've managed to build trust on the Israeli side. I know you're working hard on building trust on the Palestinian side. But frankly, uh, it's all going to end up with the mediator, you. Both sides need to trust you. Because if they don't, then you won't be able to, by any stretch of the imagination, get there. Um, what is your approach in, in getting them to trust you? They don't trust each other. That's a fact, right? As you well, mentioned. Let me, let me take two of the different things you mentioned there that I, I slightly disagree with. Um, uh, the first thing is I, I think there actually is you a lot. You disagree with me? Yes. That's a bad idea. Uh, should I? <laughs> if you want to stop this, we can. <laughs> uh, but only slight disagreements. So uh, the, the first thing uh, that you mentioned was that there's no trust between the Israelis and the Palestinians. I, I think that there's a lot of instances of great trust between Israelis and Palestinians. Uh, I think that there's not a lot of trust between the leadership, uh, and I think that's what we've been really working on, because the leadership ultimately has to come together. But I've been uh, very overwhelmed by all the uh, cases I've seen of Israelis and Palestinians working together and having great relationships and saying, look, if we could only get this thing resolved politically, then we could move on to you know, a much brighter future. Um, with regards to trust in the mediator, I think that we've done our job, but uh, both sides really trust the president. And I think that that's uh, very important because while uh, I've been working uh, the, the, the problem for the president, uh, the fact that both sides trust him and know that he has the right intentions and the right creativity and the right uh, desires to see this happen has been uh, very important. What I will say, though, is that as uh, this process has gone through, my team in particular, being three Orthodox Jews and, and, a, and a Coptic Egyptian, uh, is, is, uh, has tried very hard to do a lot of listening, not just with the Israelis, because uh, when we have titles and positions, that doesn't uh, come with trust. Trust is earned. It's not, uh, it's not granted. So 
We've gone out of our way to do a lot of listening uh, with the Palestinians, with the Israelis, to understand what their issues are, what their red lines are, why they're their red lines, and then to decide how we can find uh, areas of, of mutual agreement and to find reasons to do things as opposed to reasons not to do things. We've done the same uh, with the uh, different countries that are uh, regional stakeholders, and I think the fact that we've tried to uh, find a solution that comes from the region as opposed to imposing something. Yeah, I'd like to uh, pick on that. Sure. Because I think that uh, this is a very important point. Uh, the regional approach, uh, which is basically an outside-in approach mm -hmm. that you're taking, um, is what differentiates this period from previous period. Can you expand on that? that how, how are you planning to work with the Emiratis and Saudis and all the other Arab states um, in order to help at least make progress, engage in negotiation on the Israeli-Palestinian thing. What's, what's the strategy there? Sure, uh, so the regional dynamics are very interesting right now. Be before I talk about that though, uh, one of the points I wanna make is that we've been very focused on the deal, right? And, and spending, I guess now it's about seven, eight months that we've been very focused on that, you see a lot of reasons why this deal can go uh, south very quickly. And there's a ton of distractions that come up. You know, my team deals every month with maybe three or four different issues that, uh, that will come up. And everyone says, this is the end of it if it doesn't work. And you know, what I tell my guys, the guys, we're not chasing rabbits. And then they'll say, these aren't rabbits. These are elephants. These are big deals. They'll say, that means they're slower. We'll get to them after. But a lot of the issues that come up uh, in the relationship on a day-to-day -day basis are causes of uh, not having a final status agreement. So if you solve the bigger issue, then a lot of the little issues, uh, not little issues, because they're all very serious issues, uh, will be mitigated over time. And so we try to keep everyone focused on solving the bigger issue. And we've done a lot of work. Uh, you know, people talk about trust building exercises. I don't see a lot of trust, as you've said, so I'm not sure, you know, you could do trust exercises for the next 100 years. I'm not sure what that will really accomplish. You gotta focus on solving the big issue. The regional dynamics play a big role in what we think the opportunities are because uh, as the Middle East has evolved, a lot of these countries look and say that they all want the same thing. They want economic opportunity, they want peace for their people, and they look at the regional threats and I think they see that Israel, who is traditionally their foe, uh, is a much more natural ally to them today than uh, perhaps they were 20 years ago. So Because of Iran because of Iran, because of ISIS, because of extremism. Right. And um, you know, Israel's got a very powerful army. They've got a great economy. They've got a lot of innovation in their, in their economy. And, um, and you know, there's an old reason why this has been not put together. And so you have a lot of people who wanna see it put together, but we have to overcome this issue of the Israeli-Palestinian issue in order for that to happen. Should we see the president's trip uh, first trip, I should say, as a president to Saudi Arabia and then followed by Israel as part of this plan. Was that, does that, what was that trip about? I mean, why did you start in Saudi Arabia? Right, so, so that was something we, we spent a lot of time thinking about and uh, we ultimately decided to make the president's first trip to Saudi Arabia for uh, a few reasons. The first one was that Saudi Arabia as the custodian of the two holy sites is one of the leaders in, in the Islamic and, 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 and Muslim world. And, and we thought that that would be a great place to really convene a lot of the, the countries. So we got 54 uh, Arab and Muslim countries together for a summit, which was the first time that that had happened. And, uh, and we were really able to set out what this administration's priorities were, but then also say that we're not gonna solve all these problems ourselves. We have to solve them all together. And these problems are not just uh, America's problems, they're uh, the world's problems and and you know we were called upon all of the the leaders in in the muslim and arab world to uh to step up with us and to be our partners and to take uh, action to try and solve them the problems were uh, unifying everyone uh, against iran's aggression uh, we, we we spoke about uh, how much progress have you made there unifying everybody against iran uh, i think we've made significant progress there not just in the middle well, east how does it manifest itself in the field well, we'll find out. So, I mean, it, it will take some time, but... Jared. <laughs> you it, know, but you're not telling us. If you look at the last years before we came into office, I think a lot of these uh, countries felt like Iran was being emboldened and their aggression was being That's unchecked. True. Yeah. And I think that there was a lot of... Uh, they welcomed American leadership and they 
uh, welcomed the president's vision of everyone unifying around common objectives. So uh, the president likes to be very, very clear with the way he speaks and, and with what his intentions are. Uh, people accuse him of a lot of things, but not of being blunt and, and, and straightforward. And, um, and going into Saudi Arabia, convening 54 uh, Muslim countries, and laying out the priorities of countering Iran's aggression, of fighting extremism, of defeating ISIS, and of creating uh, peace and, and opportunity in the region was very important. Uh, King uh, Salman in his speech actually said something that uh, we thought at the time was very significant, where he said, you know, there is no uh, glory in death, uh, which we thought was very significant. And then when you go to uh, the peace in the region, uh, from the first discussions we've had with the Saudis, uh, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is something that they care a lot about. Uh, you know, the king and the crown prince care a lot about the Palestinian people. Uh, they believe that the Palestinian people should have the same hope and, and opportunity uh, as, as everyone else uh, in the world. This is Ben Salman? Yes. Sir. You're right. And, uh, and, and this has been a, a, a big priority for the king and the <clears throat> crown prince to try and see uh, the Palestinian people have that. And they recognize that. Uh, finding a solution to this uh, to this problem is the only way that that can really be achieved. So they've been uh, very committed to doing that. And it's not just the Saudis as well. It's really all of the uh, people we've been talking with, whether it's the Emiratis, the Jordanians, the Egyptians, right. the Qataris. We've seen a lot of these countries really uh, pushing very strong to try and see if they can create a solution there. Right, right. The uh, president seems really firm on his commitment to resolve this conflict. and. Uh, he also said that if you can't get it done, nobody can get it done. So I hope you can, but so that's a... Can I tell them how we met? Because I reached out to you. Please. Yes, so uh, we have a foundation and we have a guy that runs our foundation and uh, one day he calls me up and he says, I'm putting some uh, documents in storage and there's a letter from a Jared Kushner from 2010 praising you Say praising me, I don't know who this guy is, but uh, I never answered that letter. And he said, uh, yeah, it was about an article which I hated in the New Yorker. It just shred me to pieces. He loved it, go figure. But he loved it, so he wrote me a letter, you know, be, be very nice letter, I never answered it. And I said, oops, oh, here we go. Uh, so I called Jared and, um, he was very gracious and said, yeah, I'd be more than happy to, I know who you are. Well, he wrote me a letter, I never answered, you know, so. Uh, but I didn't know who he was, and uh, this is how we met, and, uh, and I'm glad I did so, and we became friends, and we exchanged ideas on an ongoing basis. Uh, he advises me, and I advise him. Whether he takes my advice, I have no idea, but uh, that's a separate conversation. Um, but going back to the president, uh, what, what drives him to, I mean, what's this about? His commitment that seems to be so firm to get a deal done. Is it your influence? Is it his heart? Is it, what is it? I mean, is it a combination of both? He seems really committed to get something done. Why does he care so much about it? So uh, I'll talk to the president's commitment to this issue, but uh, to, to talk about your story, I, I recall reading that article in The New Yorker many years ago and being impressed with the way that you'd obviously accomplished a lot of things in your professional life, but then devoted yourself to a lot of causes, uh, not just with your financial resources, but also with your time uh, that you really wanted to make a difference in. So I had admiration for that. I wrote a letter, and I'd forgotten about it, too, till I got a call. Uh, then well, we're in the middle, you. of course, but then we're in the uh, middle of a... 10 years, I can say thank you, yeah. Uh, the, <laughs> but then we're in the middle of a presidential campaign, and needless to say, we were on slightly different sides. And, uh, and I got a call from Heinz Bond, and I said, what the hell is going on here? <laughs> <laughs> and um, so Haim called me, we got together, and I don't know if you remember what I said to you, because, you know, your primary concern was, uh, was obviously you care a lot about the U.S.-Israel relationship for a lot of reasons, and... You know, you said to me, well, I'm very concerned. I don't know much about uh, Trump, and, and I don't know what this means for Israel. And I don't know if you remember what I told you, but I, I remember saying that uh, you should hope that Trump wins if you care about the U.S.-Israel relationship, because there'd be no better president who could strengthen the relationship and try to cause change in the region if Trump wins. And so I'm not going to put you on the spot at the forum and ask you if, in retrospect, you're happy with the outcome or not. Okay, let's talk about Hillary. <laughs> but, let's talk about Hillary. But, okay, so... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, uh, but, but, but well, I look, I mean, the rhetoric is there. 
Yeah. And, you know, the team of lawyers that have no clue about the Middle East is there. <laughs> uh, you know, the commitment, I mean, looking from the outside in, you know, it appears to be there to get something done. I mean, you fly to Saudi Arabia unannounced for a day and a half, you spend the night speaking. I don't think you're necessarily speaking so much about Yemen. So I don't know what you spoke about, but I'm assuming. So there is no question that, you know, it comes across to us looking from the outside in that there is a commitment yeah. there. And uh, the team that is working on it, I'm sure, uh, have their heart, starting with you, have their heart into getting a deal done and bringing peace to the Middle East, which is all of us, all of us here, hope for. So, you know, I wish you luck. It's, uh, Thank you. Yeah, well, I wish you luck. Well, well I will say, you know, to, to your question on the president's commitment, yeah. um, you know, the, the way that I try to define the president's uh, foreign policy objectives to people is that he really has two major foreign policy objectives, uh, peace and prosperity. And uh, the president wants us to work on all areas where he can end as much conflict as possible, create as much peace, and then uh, he obviously wants to see a world where there's as much uh, you know, growth in, in economic opportunity as possible. The difference maybe between uh, this president and the past is he wants to fight hard to get as much of that economic growth into America. So you know, that's really where America first, he wants to make good deals for our country, he wants to figure out how to uh, create good opportunity to bring that back. Uh, figuring out how to bring peace and, and how to strengthen the U.S.-Israel relationship, he sees as an integral part of uh, furthering both of those so objectives. So it's part of an overall plan, if you yes, say. If but, you but, it, but it's very personal to him, and he sees right. this as something that uh, is very integral to, uh, to, to America and to, uh, to his personal values. Oh, I'm glad to hear that. That's, uh, that's encouraging. So as I said, you know, I wish you luck. So there is a plan. There's a speculation, there's a plan. You gotta have a plan by now. I mean, four lawyers, come on. It's gotta be a plan. Tell us what it is. I thought with, <laughs> I thought with four lawyers, you're guaranteed not to get to a plan if you have so many lawyers working on it. Uh, no, we- Jason Greenblatt here, where is he? Right here. We got and him. then I met with David Friedman when I was in Israel. And who, who's the fourth one? Uh, Dina Powell. She's not a lawyer. She is not a lawyer. She's yeah. out. Okay, so. But, but I will say, you know, we work, us, yes. we, we work with all the agencies very well. Uh, you know, we, we've read in uh, people at the State Department, uh, all the uh, different agencies. So, uh, so we've got plenty of lawyers around who are looking to get involved if, if, if we need any more help. Um, I think with regards to what we've done is we've solicited a lot of ideas from a lot of places. There's obviously speculation all the time about uh, whether there is a plan, there isn't a plan, and... Uh, and what's in it, and then people, reporters will call and say, well, we hear that you've got these four points are in and these two points are out, and then I'm looking around the room and all the people in the room I know don't talk to the media, they're all very trustworthy, and I know that none of them have spoke to this reporter, so we all kind of laugh and say, okay, we're just not gonna play the guessing game. So I think that one of the reasons we've been able to come this far is that you know, the, we, we know what's in uh, the plan, we've, the, the Palestinians know what discussions we've had with them, the Israelis know what discussions we've had with them, and- um, So you can tell us. Okay, so let me start. Uh, no, so, so we're not going to disclose that today, but, but I, I, I am optimistic that there is a lot of hope for being able to bring a, a conclusion to this. And I'll also say that, you know, especially with the people who are here today, there's been so much work on this uh, problem set for so many years by so many people who have been so devoted to the cause. So uh, a lot of you here have been very generous uh, with your time, uh, talking with, with myself, my team, uh, with your writings and, uh, and with your thoughts. And that's been very helpful also to us developing uh, the ideas that we ultimately believe have the potential uh, to be successful. So uh, we're working forward. You know, one thing people always ask us is they, um, is they say, you know, well, you have a timeline, when's this, when's that? And we're business people, we're not politicians, and you're a businessman. And, and you know that uh, when you do deals, sometimes you have deals you think will go very quickly and they take forever. And then you have deals sometimes you think will take forever and they go very quickly. So we've been very deliberate about not setting time frames, not uh, uh, trying to do this the way that it's been done before so that we have more room and opportunity to hopefully be successful with it. And the, the whole story with the embassy coming on Wednesday, can you tell us something about this? Uh, I'll tell you what we're telling everyone else, which is No, that don't the... tell me what you're telling everybody else. Are you kidding me? <laughs> yeah, I mean, so... look at this crowd here. Yeah. You can put a pin in here that's so crowded. 
They all came for you. It's okay. All the reporters have already called saying they have inside sources that know what the decision <laughs> is. But what I'll say is, is that the president's going to make his decision. And, uh, and, um, with he hasn't the, made his decision? Uh, he's still uh, looking at a lot of different facts and that mm. when he makes his decision, uh, he'll be the one to want to tell you, not me. So, uh, so he'll, he'll, he'll make sure he does that at the right time. So um, basically, you're not going to tell us? Not today. Okay. Wednesday, Thursday. I'll, say, I'll call you on Thursday. Perfect. After the president says, you can repeat what he said. Perfect. Perfect. Deal. So I'd like to end on a personal note. Uh, for a young man, you had a pretty successful. You have a pretty successful career as a businessman uh, in the real estate business. Your wife had her own career. Uh, and then you dropped all this and put it in trust or whatever you had to do by law. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't know how much they pay you, but I know the American government doesn't pay a lot. So, um, and you decided to do this. Tell us a little bit about the changes. Your family, people don't know you. So tell us a little bit about this. Tell us about how did you adopt your life into Washington. The kids, do they like it? Ivanka? Ivanka. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Tell us how you met Ivanka. <laughs> we could go through that as well. We, we actually got introduced by two business colleagues, and, uh, and I got very, very lucky in that one. But Yes, you did. Uh, very, very lucky. Yes, um, you did. But uh, what I would say is that uh, for us, we, we did not plan our lives like we would go into politics. You know, Ivanka's father decided to run for president, and then we slowly uh, got you know, more and more into the campaign. And uh, as we saw more of the country, we, we saw a lot of the problems. We met a lot of the people. We uh, saw that he was fighting for a lot of change that really needed to, to happen for the country. And so, uh, so we, uh, we helped with the campaign, and then when he said he was coming to Washington. Uh, we, 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 we made the decision to, to leave our lives and to do this. And um, look, it's definitely been, uh, we've probably been working harder than we've ever worked before. I mean, every day, uh, it's, a different, um, it's a different challenge. I think that, uh, you know, we, we view it like you have a short amount of time to create as much impact as possible uh, in the areas that you really care about. And so, uh, whether it's working on the peace process or working on the U.S.-Mexico relationship, which I know you also care about, uh, you know, working on uh, you know our, the technology upgrades that we're working uh, on throughout the government, working with Kellyanne on, on the opioids, and working on the improvements we're making in the VA and improving uh, you know the future of workforce. That we've been figuring out how we get Americans trained for the jobs of, of, of tomorrow and 10 years from now. There's so much great work that 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 needs to be done, that can be done, and we feel very honored to be able to do it. And what I will say is that every day you know we come in. The reason why we we've been working so hard is that. Uh, we feel like it's just sand going through an hourglass, and, and you know, before we know it, it'll be over. And so uh, we're going to work as hard as we can to make as much impact we can on the areas that we care about. And, and that's really how we judge ourselves. So you know, we try not to get distracted by the day-to-day, -day and, and we don't pay a lot of attention to the, the noise. Scrutiny, but it's, the press, yeah. the media in general. How do you deal with that? I mean, this is not a world you're familiar with, you know, even though you own the newspaper, but basically, you know, you, now you can't open the TV or read a newspaper that there's not a story about you or about Ivanka's shoes or this one's ties or I don't know what. Always going back to you, analyzing what you did, what you didn't say, uh, what you're doing, what you're not doing. Yeah. Is that disturbing you? Uh, I don't let it bother me. I mean, there, there are people who, uh, who are good at dealing with the media. My focus is on the objectives, and, and we'll stay focused on the different missions. And, you know, we're here to serve the country, and we'll just keep going. And, and you know, what, what I am confident is that when our, when our service is done, uh, we'll look back and we won't say, oh, there was a bad story on this, there was a bad story on that. We'll look back and we'll say, did we spend every minute we could to push as hard as we could on the issues we cared about to make as big of an impact as possible? So we feel uh, very, uh, very fortunate to be able to have the opportunity to work for, for this country that uh, we think is, is the greatest country in the world. And so we're just going to keep going. And, um, you know, and look, I, I think that it's, uh, you know, you can choose what you spend your time on every day. And, and unfortunately, if we spent our times focusing on, on trying to, you know, correct things or deal with the media, then we wouldn't have time to do the other things. So 
Uh, so, you know, we do the best we can with that, but we don't let it bother us. And, you know, we recognize that it's, uh, it's politics. That's the sport of it. And people will either agree or disagree with what you said or didn't say. Um, but that's not what's real. What's real at the end of the day is what you accomplish, the differences you make, the lives you impact. And that's what we stay very focused on. And, and uh, you know, look, DC is a different place. We never thought we'd move out of New York. Um, and, uh, but the kids are loving it here. Uh, the schools are great. And, um, and my wife and I feel like we've made a difference so far, and there's a lot more impact that we have the ability to make. So that's uh, great. Thank you. Jared, thank you so very much. Thank I you. Appreciate it.